we want to just take a moment as we um, are moving into this last final part of this series that we've been in, the hunger series. We just want to commend you as pastors. For those of you that have really just trusted God in your faith and you've stepped out, um, many of you for the first time, you've, you're trying fasting and prayer and you're realizing uh, hopefully by now that it works. If not, you will uh, because God's promises are true. And we know that many of you have just really stepped out and sacrifice and you've been praying and you've been fasting, you've been trusting God and seeking God's face. And, and we, we just want to commend you and thank you for, um, for trusting us as your pastors to do something that we don't want to do in our flesh. Nobody likes doing it. I do not like fasting, guys. I like food just like you do. I'm a human being. I don't sleep on clouds at night. I sleep in a bed just like you do. And I, I don't like fasting, but I do love drawing closer to the living God. I do love taking him at his word and experiencing his incredible promises, everything that he has for us. I don't know about you, but I don't want just some of what God has for me. Do you just want some of what he has or do you want all of what he has for you? I want, I want everything that he has for us. So we want to thank you guys. And I know it's been hard. Um, I know personally how hard it's been for us because the first Sunday in the 21 day stretch, we went down to her mom and dad's house like we always do on Sunday afternoons. And man, her parents can cook. They lay out the spread. I'm telling you, it is so hard. And some might say, why did you go down there, right? Because we love our family and we love hanging out with our, 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 uh, our, our nephews and, and, and everybody. Our, our kids, they're all there. And it's like a big party. We have a really big family and we just have a great time. So we wanted to be there, but we forgot that it was our nephew Colt's fifth birthday. All right? So here we are. We, I we did not forget... Colt's birthday. <laughs> I for, I for, well, I didn't know we were celebrating it that okay. day. You didn't realize there was a birthday party happening. I didn't realize there was a, like a party happening. Yeah. So we walked through the mudroom, and all of a sudden, the aromas of Italy slapped me right in the face. Guys, keep in mind, we get here really early, about 5 in the morning, and we do services all day, and normally don't make it down there until about 2.30 in the afternoon. So on a normal Sunday, forget fasting and prayer. We are hangry. We are, we are desperate for food. We are so hungry and ready to eat. But this is a little bit different because... Like when you know you're fasting, you've made a commitment, it's totally different, right? So we step in the door, we smell this amazing smell, and we walk around the corner, and they have a full pizza buffet. I'm talking like seven or eight like boxes of pizza, the lids are open, and guys, I'm talking about like like Ephesians 6, straight up demonic warfare. This is spiritual battle. I can almost see Satan right in front of me with an Italian sausage in one hand and a steamy, ooey, gooey, cheesy pepperoni in the other just laughing at me, taunting me, saying, I know you want some. Guys, this is real. The battle is real. It's hard. I know it's hard. But I also know that God's faithful, and I know that he blesses our obedience. He blesses our sacrifice. And at times, you know, when you're fasting and praying, you don't see the fruit of your prayers right away. You don't always see God moving. You don't always see God working. But as believers, we need to remind ourselves that we walk by faith and not by sight. You can't ever base your, 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 your spirit, the spiritual condition or the spiritual atmosphere of what God is really doing in your life based on what you see and based off of what you feel. But as fully devoted followers of Christ, we have to remind ourselves each and every day that God is faithful to his word and we can trust him and take him at his word. Do you believe that today? Amen. Well, whether you do or you don't, it's true. Yeah. It is absolutely true. God is faithful. You can clap. If, if one claps, we all clap. God is faithful at his word. And, and when, we, when we step out in faith and, and fasting and, and, and trusting God through our, our times of prayer, you just have to know, according to his word, that he's going to bring provision into your life. He's going to bring protection. He's going to bring his favor. He's going to bring blessings. He's going to bring guidance and wisdom. Because many times uh, when people are fasting and praying, they're seeking God's direction for their lives. And I want to tell you that God will always meet you right where you are. God is faithful. His word says in Psalm 5 and 12, it says, surely, Lord, you will bless the righteous. You will bless those who are in right positioning with you. You know that our relationship with God is all about right positioning. It's all about perspective and it's all about positioning. It's all about relationship and not religion. Amen. It's all about getting close to God. And that's what this whole series has been about, the hunger series. It's getting close to God and wanting him more than anything else. His word says in that verse, you surround us 
with your favor as with a shield. I want you to think about that surround. That's, that, that is 360. That is all the way around you when you're in right positioning with God. He surrounds you with a shield and he protects you and he blesses you and he goes with you. I don't know about you, but when I step out into my day, I want God to go with me. I don't want to do it on my own. Amen. And so God is faithful. You can take him at his word. He will always meet you right where you're at. So today we're going to move into part three. This is the final message in this series, the hunger series. And we're talking about how God sees what no one else sees. So as we talk about this in part three, God sees what no one else sees. There's a lot of things that God sees. He sees every single thing you do. He sees the good. He sees the bad. He sees the ugly. He sees it all. But today we really want to focus on two things that make the biggest difference in our walk as a believer. And the first thing that God sees is God sees your sacrifice. You need to understand that God sees your sacrifice. He sees those things that you're doing in secret. He sees the moments when you're struggling, but you don't give in. He sees the moments where you do, when you fall down, when you give in, when you give into that temptation possibly, but you get back up and you go again. God sees your sacrifice through the last 21 days. And for those of you who maybe you're like, I'm brand new and I, I wasn't a part of that. I didn't even realize it. Listen, it doesn't matter where we are in our walk with God, whether you're a brand new believer, whether you're trying to figure things out, or you've been serving the Lord for many, many years, there are sacrifices that are a part of our walk with Jesus. And when God watches your life, he wants to see those sacrifices in the private. I'm going to take you this morning to 1 Kings chapter 7, and I'm going to kind of give you some context before we dive right in. In 1 Kings chapter 7, King Solomon is the one that's in charge, and he is building the tabernacle, okay, or the temple. He's building the temple. Can you throw up an image of it for me? There we go. So in the, in the Old Testament, when they were, the Israelites were in the um, wilderness, they had the tabernacle. That's where God's presence dwelt. But in the Old Testament after that, they built the temple, and Solomon was the one who was building it. Now, I want you to understand a couple things about this. This took 120,000 men to build. It took seven and a half years to build, okay? And the point was, this is literally where God's presence dwelt. But symbolically, everything you saw in the Old Testament, you see in the New Testament in the life of the believer. And the Bible says that you and I, that we are now the temple of the Holy Spirit, where God's presence dwells dwells. Okay. So he was showing them symbolically, this is where I'm going to dwell. But when my son comes, the Holy Spirit's going to come to indwell the believer on the inside. You and I then become literally the tabernacle. So when you're walking around, God's presence is on the inside of you, impacting anyone that you come in contact with. Okay. So go with me to first Kings chapter seven. <clears throat> It says in verse 13, King Solomon then asked for a man named Hiram to come from Tyre. He was half Israelite and he was half Tyre. Now I'm just going to, for the sake of time, I'm going to kind of just explain this to you. Tyre was a, a place where they did Baal worship and Hiram's dad was a craftsman who created idols, okay, for Baal worship. But his mom was a woman of faith. She was a Jewish person. She was an Israelite. Hiram had taken up the gifts and talents his dad had passed down. He was a craftsman with bronze. King Solomon has literally called him in to do one thing, and that is create. If you'll go to those pillars, I want to show you real fast. He's going to create these pillars that you saw on the front of the tabernacle. These were basically ornamental pillars that were going to be out there, and he was like seriously probably the best craftsman that Solomon could have brought in. So he brings him in. And here's what I want you to notice in verse 15. He starts giving the details of the pillars. He says this, Hiram cast two bronze pillars, each 27 feet tall. That is really tall. It's almost three stories. 18 feet in circumference. For the top, the pillars he cast bronze capitals and each seven and a half feet tall. So basically you had 27 feet tall pillars and on top of that, these capitals that were seven and a half feet tall, making it how tall? 34 and a half feet tall. Okay, that is over three stories. I want you to just think about this and you're like, where are you going with this? Well, hang with me, okay? The next few verses, he goes through mass detail about 
how he designed those pillars. But here's what I want you to really see. It says in verse 19, the capitals on the column on the inside entry room were shaped like water lilies and they were six feet tall. The capitals on the two pillars had 200 pomegranates in two rows around them beside the rounded surface next to the lattice work. Now it goes on to basically describe that he gave each of them a name. They were set then in the front of the tabernacle on the north and the south side. Here's what I want you to begin to understand about this passage. This is over three stories tall. The work that he did on the inside of these capitals, okay, where the lily work was done, wasn't going to be able to be seen by any human eye, okay? They didn't have planes. Nobody's flying over to see the top of it, okay? It would be like me coming over to your home, going up in your attic, and me expecting you to have decorated that space in your home. How many of you guys have a nicely decorated attic? Nobody? Oh, one person. Okay. We don't decorate our attics, right? I mean, what's up there? Some studs, maybe some junk. I've never even been in our attic, nor do I want to be in our attic. We don't store anything up there. But like if you have junk up there, your Christmas decor or whatever, nobody is going up there. It's not for anybody else to see, right? Do you agree? Okay, that's what was going on at the top of these, these pillars where he does the lily work. Nobody was going to see it. And so I want to ask you today, ask yourself, why in the world would he spend this kind of time and this kind of detail to put these water lilies in these pillars? Why would he do that? Da, 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 da. Why would he do that? Because he wasn't doing it for any man to see. He wasn't doing it so that he could have the applause of man. He wasn't doing it for the man's human eye to see it. He was doing it for one reason. He was doing it just for God. He was doing it only for God to see. And here's the question I want to ask you. What is the lily work you've been doing in your life? What is the thing that you've been working on in your life that nobody else can see? It's just between you and God. You see, when we fast and pray, there is a sacrifice that is made that other people don't see. You see, no, we, don't, we don't go around flaunting the fact that, oh, we're fa- oh, I can't have that. I'm fasting. Pat me on the back. I've been in my prayer closet for an hour already this morning. We don't do that. We don't do that. We do it for God alone. You see, there's lily work in the life of a believer. As you begin to mature, there's things that we do that only are for God. You guys need to talk or this is going to go on all day. You can say amen. That's good. You can clap your hands. When it's quiet, I feel like you don't get it, and I'm going to need to hit it about three other angles, it's, okay? It's the same thing in our relationship. It's not much different. Um, exactly. If you don't nod your head, I, if you saying. don't say I got it, yes, honey. I'm going to yes. go round and round yes. this bush, I hear, okay? I hear you, baby. The fact <laughs> is, there are things in our life that we sacrifice that we're not looking for the applause of man. You see, God looks at the heart. Man looks at the outward. We can come to church and we try to put our best stuff on. We want to look like we got our life all together, but God sees the heart. He sees the sacrifice you've been making as you're trying to live for him. He sees the sacrifice when you get on your face and you cry out to him and you're believing for the breakthrough. That's the lily work that you're doing. That isn't for anybody else, just for our father. And here's what I want you to understand is he not only sees it, but he's proud of you and he rewards you for what you're doing in the secret. Go to the New Testament, go to Matthew, Matthew chapter six. This is a passage that whether you're a believer or not, you've heard this passage. It's the passage where the disciples come to Jesus and they say, teach us how to pray. And so Jesus lays out the Lord's prayer. But in this passage, I love this verse. In verse 16, it says this, and when you fast, and when you fast, I'm going to say it again. And when you fast, notice that second word. He didn't say, and if you fast, if by chance you might be fasting someday, he said, when you fast, what was Jesus saying? He said, I'm going to teach you how to pray. I'm going to teach you how to fast because there is a supernatural power that comes together in the life of a believer when you do the hard things. We talked about those hard things last week. And he says in this passage, it's not if you fast or if you want to fast, but when you fast. Because a believer who is maturing, 
A fully devoted follower of Jesus is part of our life. So he goes on to say, don't make it obvious because here's what was happening. The Pharisees, they wanted to be seen by man because they wanted the applause of man. They wanted to stand on the street corner and they wanted to pray these big, beautiful, powerful prayers. And they wanted to fast and they would literally make their faces look like, oh, woe is me, I'm fasting, I'm famished. And he said, don't do that. That's ridiculous, do not do that. And notice what he says. He goes on in verse 17, he says, but when you fast, comb your hair, wash your face, then no one will notice that you are fasting except the Father who knows what you do in private and your Father who sees everything will reward you. See, God sees what no one else sees. God sees when you didn't give in to that temptation. God sees the endless amount of time you've spent on your face crying out to him, believing him for a miracle, believing for a breakthrough. He sees the time that you're in your word when nobody else sees it. He sees the sacrifice you make. And when he sees it, he not only sees it, he rewards you for it. And just as a side note today, you know, some of you... um Today might be your first day here at the church. Maybe you've been with us for a while and maybe you, you knew about this, you know, fasting and prayer, this crazy thing that these pastors are trying to get you to do. Uh, we want to tell you guys, there's, there's never any judgment or criticism for those that don't choose to step in. Um, our job as pastors is to show you the word, to reveal the power of his word to you and to equip you for the work of ministry. We just simply know that Jesus for 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted before he stepped out to fulfill his purpose and his calling. And it says that he went out in the spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit after 40 days of fasting and prayer. And he was positioned in power to do all the great things that God called him and brought him to earth to do. And, and, and it's, it's no different for you. You're breathing right now. Your heart is pumping. That means you have a purpose. That purpose has been given to you by God far before, long before you ever entered your mother's womb. God gave you an incredible purpose to be lived out in this earth so that one day you would stand before your father in heaven and you would give an account and you would show him the things that you did with your time, your talent, and your treasure to bring glory to his name. Trust me, there will be a day that comes and we stand before the Lord. Amen? Amen. There's going to be a day and when we stand before him, don't you want to hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. So we, we bring you messages and we like this that, and, 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 and we put out, you know, fasting and prayer as a challenge to you because we want to stretch you. Right. We want to draw out all the good things that God has for you. Then that means we're going to have to decrease so th- to our flesh so that God can increase inside of us. Yeah. Is fasting easy? No. Does anybody love it? No, we don't. But we do love the, 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 the benefits and the effects of God's promises and his word through fasting and prayer. So again, he, he sees the things when we fast and when we pray, he sees the things that no one else sees. He sees your sacrifices. He knows it's hard, but guess what? You're doing it for him. It is a gift from you to your father. You know what else he sees? He sees your persistence. How, how often, how many times in your relationship with God have you found yourself going before the Lord and you have been asking and praying for the same thing over and over and over and over, and over, and over, and over. Can I tell you today, and I'm going to show you this in his word, it's okay to ask. It's okay to keep asking. God sees your persistence. Right after this passage that Misty's talking about, it's not when you fast and pray, it's, 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 it's not if, it's when. But right after that, he, he tells us how he wants us to come at him with our prayers. Check this out. In chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, he says, look, I want you to ask, I want you to keep on asking. Yeah. And you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you for whoever, for everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And everyone who knocks, the door will be open. So this reminds me of a time early in our ministry 
For those of you that don't know our story, we, we started Mount Movers Church in our mobile home about 100 feet that way. It's the middle of the parking lot right now. And we started with one couple. Actually, they're right here on the front row. Wave. It's Monty and Kathy Keith and their beautiful family. They started with us, one couple. And we did a Bible study in our mobile home uh, for about a year. And we invited families to come. And they thought we were a cult, so we really couldn't get that many people. Um, <laughs> It was weird, okay? It's really hard to start a church from a mobile home. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, in the middle of a field, in no town per se. Uh, it was weird. But nonetheless, God blessed it, and we filled the mobile home. Now, in those days, it wasn't really of the mindset to go to two services in a mobile home. Uh, it never crossed our mind to, to have, you know, two services, uh, multiple services in that mobile home. Um, so we were up against a big dilemma. We needed a space to worship. And the problem, a little teeny little problem, we didn't have any money. And uh, we, we, we desperately needed, the, we knew that the, the only way for this church to really take off was for us to get out of the mobile home and get into a place where we could really begin to grow and invite families. And we began praying, guys. We began fasting and praying and seeking the face of God and, and, and just over and over and over and over praying for the same stinking thing. And we didn't stop. And I want to tell you, like, not only were we spiritually knocking, we were physically knocking on doors all over Grove, asking if, you know, businesses and, you know, schools and, you know, the high school, the library, uh, community event centers, we were asking everybody, knocking and saying, please, will you let us have church in your building? And the answer was no. Every single door that we knocked on, no door would open. I just want to, I want to teach you something real quick, just about seeking God's will. A lot of times you get so mad when the door doesn't open. You're like, God, you didn't answer my prayer. Yes, he did. The answer was no. No is an answer. Is it not? God's faithful. Come on, parents. Is no an answer? How it often is. do you thank God? I, we don't see it that way, but how often, how many times have you thanked God when he answered you, but the answer was no? Y'all, it's a process of elimination. Yeah. <laughs> but keep on asking, yeah. keep on seeking, yeah. keep on knocking. And eventually, look, when you're about your father's business, your father will be about your business. Yeah. Eventually, yeah. he is going to give you exactly what you need, exactly when you yeah. need it. So for us, there was only one door that opened. And guess what else? It's not always the door that you want to open. Right. The one door that opened was a farmhouse about 100 feet away. And that farmhouse today is Mountain Movers Kids. We started in that farmhouse after we stepped out of the mobile home and began inviting family, started a daycare, and God began to, guess what? He blessed it because we were about our father's business. It didn't look the way we expected it to. It did not look the way we wanted it to. God's will won't always look the way you want it to. It won't always happen the way you expect it to. But know this. If you knock and you need it, God will answer. He will show up and he will prove himself over and over and over to be faithful. He will. We walk by faith and not by sight. You have to trust him. This next verse. Real I'm going to break in because okay, I just want, I want you to oh, yeah. be aware Today, that, you know, after 17 day. years of doing services in that farmhouse and thousands of people hearing the gospel message, today will be the last Sunday that the gospel is ever preached in that building. Today's the last day that Momentum will be in that room. Next Sunday, Momentum will move into the fireside room. And you know, as we look back, like we were so not excited about that being our next season. We were not excited about that being God's will. We were not excited about that door opening 17 years ago, but today it's a little bittersweet. When I really think about the fact that we're gonna tear the building down, even though it needs to go, it's an old building. And we're gonna build a beautiful kids' church and it's gonna be amazing to think about the lives that were changed because, you know, it wasn't about the building. It's never about that. It was about God's presence and it was about God's perfect will. And sometimes it doesn't look like what you want it to look like. And sometimes we get frustrated, as Brad said, when we're sacrificing. We're like, God, don't you see us? We're praying, we're sacrificing. And we've got an idea in our mind on how we want things to play out. And when it doesn't play out that way, then we get frustrated.
frustrated at God. But guys, it's a journey of learning how to trust God. It's a journey of learning to say, God, I want what you want, not what I want. God, I want this. But if that's not what you want for me, I want your will. Over the last couple of years, as we've been raising, I guess, adult children, I don't consider my children adults, but they're technically adults. And they're having to learn how to make decisions now on their own. And so many things have happened in the last couple of years where we are saying, guys, we're praying God's will. We're praying together for this situation and that situation. And they want a certain thing, they think. And I'm like, okay, listen, this is how we're praying. God, we want your will. God, we want your will. God, we want your will. Just last Sunday, this happened in a situation and we were going to head one direction. And I told one of her daughters, I said, listen, we're praying God's will be done. If this isn't his will, shut the door and shut it fast and shut it hard. Within 30 minutes, that door shut. And that wasn't easy. It wasn't easy, but guess what? When God shuts a door and you know that's what you're praying, he gives you peace because you're like, okay, I trust you. That wasn't your plan. So know this, God sees you. He sees your sacrifice in private. He, he, he sees your, your persistence. He, he hear, his word says that he hears the cry of the humble. What posture do you envision when you hear the word humble? What does that look like? This. Making yourself low and saying, God, none of this is about me, but it's about you. And I want what you want. And I just pray, God, that you would hear my prayers. And I love you and I trust you. He hears the cry of the humble. Fasting and prayer humbles us. It, it, it murders our flesh. <laughs> and it causes our spirit to come alive. But it comes through humility, making yourself low. And, and denying the things that your flesh wants. And saying, God, I want what you want. And when you can do that, when you can figure this out to get really hungry for God, means to be filled with more of his spirit, y'all, God will begin to unlock things that you never thought was possible in your life. That the blessings and favor of God that I'm talking about has fueled this church. As you look around and you see a room full, you think about we started in a mobile home. That wasn't Brad and Misty that did that, guys. That was God. And he will do the exact same thing in your life. He will be glorified in your life if you will make yourself low and get in the secret, quiet, private place of worship and prayer and get hungry for him. And say, God, I trust you. He sees your sacrifice. He sees your persistence. His word says that the, the passionate prayers of the righteous are effective. You can pray. You can pray hard. You can keep on praying. And you need to know beyond the shadow of a doubt, God hears you. Amen. You may not get the answer right away, but know by faith, according to the promises of his word, he hears you and God will not deny you. The next verse says, will a father deny his son a loaf of bread if he's hungry? No. Nor will your heavenly father deny you exactly what you need when you are in right positioning with him and you're not about your own business, but you're about his business, he will give you, ex he will not deny you what you need to fulfill his purpose. It's his purpose. He's gonna resource, he's gonna give you everything you need to do his will. But you got to get close to the father, so close you can hear him whisper. He says, be still and hear the still small voice of God, the whisper of God. The only way you can do that is to get close to your father, which means you have to deny your flesh. Let's pray. Father, we are incredibly grateful for your word. We thank you for this series. We thank you, God, for 21 days of promise, 21 days of power, 21 days of preparation as you begin to align this church for your purpose and your plans and your pleasure. I pray that you would be glorified, God, through these 21 days. I pray that you would be so glorified in the lives of every person under the sound of my voice, God, that has stepped out in faith and trusted you and went after you, the people that have just really developed a hunger and a thirst for you, God. Bless. Bless us. 
and let us do your will. With heads bowed and eyes closed, he sees you. He sees what no one else sees. And if you don't have a real relationship with him today, he sees you. And guess what? He loves you. And his arms are open wide and he's saying, come to me. All of you who are hungry and weak and tired and I will fill you and I will give you strength. I'll bless you. Not with religion, but with relationship with the living God. You can have a relationship with him by simply asking him to forgive you of your sins and believing in your heart that Jesus is Lord, making him the Lord of your life and giving him full control as the king of your heart, allowing him to sit on the throne and just saying, God, my life belongs to you. It's no longer my own. If you do that, it's through Jesus Christ, you're saved, you're set free. This world is not your home and heaven becomes your home. So if you're in this room today and you would like to make that decision or if you're watching online and you'd like to make that decision, we're gonna pray a prayer as a church family here in just a moment. But before we do, would you just, just slip your hand up if that's you so we can see who we're praying with and who we'll be praying for this week if that's you. And if you're watching online, just comment all in in the comment section below. And let's pray this prayer together. Father, forgive me of my sins. I believe with all my heart, Jesus is the Son of God. I confess with my mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord. I give you control, God, control over my heart and my mind. I give you my life. Thank you that you see me. You see the things no one else sees. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Today, as we commemorate the 21 days of fasting and prayer, we're going to receive communion together. Those of you who want to participate, the worship host would have given you elements as you came through the door today. If you'll just take out the bread, I want you for just a moment to just think about the fact that, you know, fasting and praying is hard, but God never asked us to do something that he himself wasn't willing to do. And the sacrifice that God made for us was sending his one and only son. And Jesus sacrificed his very own life so that you and I could experience the forgiveness of sin and forgiveness into eternal life. So today, as we take the bread, I want you to just close your eyes and in your own way, just begin to say, thank you, Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for the bread. We thank you for your body that was completely destroyed. We thank you that you were willing to hang on the cross, that you were willing to endure the pain and the shame and the humiliation that came with crucifixion. We realize that it was only because of your love that you were willing to sacrifice your body. The Bible says that by your stripes, we are healed physically, emotionally, spiritually. Thank you, Jesus, for the healing power that comes only through your broken body. Jesus, we thank you. Amen. You may take of the bread. The night that Jesus was arrested, he met with his disciples prior, and we call it the Last Supper. And after he blessed the bread, he held up a cup of wine. And it's interesting when you hold up wine, or in this case, grape juice and the light, it turns crimson red, representing blood, to remind us of the blood that was poured out on the cross. And blood, when you remove blood from any animal, you remove its life. And you know, without Jesus' blood being poured out for us, we would have no life. We would have death in our sins. It's because of his death on the cross, because, because of the blood that was poured out, we receive everlasting life. And so today we thank him for his blood. Father, we are so grateful for your son, Jesus. Thank you for your blood, Jesus. Thank you that you poured it out so that we would not die in our sins, but we would live 
Thank you for the life-giving power of your blood. Thank you, God, that you've been resurrected, raised to life again. And now we have new life, everlasting life in you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can drink.